Good morning, Southwest. In Psalm 118, we're reminded that today is the day that the Lord has made and that we should rejoice and be glad in it. I want to welcome you guys. Let's rise together, both here and online. Let's bring our praise to the Lord today. Just the opportunity to give him everything that's worth for him. Let's sing out. to uh, Southwest Community Church. So glad that you are with us this morning. Uh, let the joy be in your heart and let it come out of your mouth and out of your spirit this morning. Our prayer, as always, here at Southwest, is that this is a place you meet God. 
Uh, so if you're here for the first time, welcome. We call ourselves a family of families, so welcome to our family. If you are looking for a new church home or a new family, uh, our prayer is that you would be welcome, you'd be greeted, you would not only sense the love of Christ in this place, but the power of God in this place. And so as we gather for worship, we'd like to prepare our hearts for worship. We do that in a couple of ways. We like to read scripture aloud together, and we like uh, to pray and prepare our hearts for worship. I was asked this week, why do you do a responsive reading before every service? And I thought that was a good question. So if you're new, let me explain why we do this. We are not here to entertain anyone. This is a corporate body and we are in corporate worship. And so we invite you in to participate in worship. So part of the reason why we do this scripture reading is so that we all participate in the reading of God's word. It's also a good reminder of who God is and his holiness and his act and will and plan in our lives. And so we invite you, participate in worship. Don't just watch other people worship this day. So as we prepare our hearts for worship, we're going to go to Psalm 8. I'll read the regular text. If you'll join me with the bold text, I would appreciate it. As we prepare our hearts, Psalm 8 says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Please join me. Out of the mouth of babes and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet all sheep and oxen, also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. How majestic is the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today we are here to exalt him, to exalt his name, to worship him, to bow our knee before our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to give you a moment of silent prayer, and this is your time to commune with your Heavenly Father, to prepare your heart for worship. If you've walked into this room today with unrepented sin, this is a great time for you to repent of that sin, get your heart right, be ready to hear his word, to receive what he has for you today. So let's just spend a moment of silent prayer, preparing our hearts for worship this morning. So dear Heavenly Father, still our hearts today. May our soul focus be on you and you alone. May we walk away from the distraction and the noise and the chaos of this world to highlight our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To worship you as King of kings and Lord of lords. We've already read the words, how majestic is your name in all of the earth, in all of the universe. And there will be a day that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess the lordship of Jesus Christ. So today, you are precious in our hearts and in our eyes and in our lives. And we come to you with open hands and open hearts, ready to receive your word, bowing the knee to our Lord and Savior, praying with expectancy that you are still doing your work in and through our lives. So God, change us and transform us, even in this hour that we meet you 
and you speak to us. Do your work in this place this day. Pray all these things in the powerful, majestic name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's continue to sing this morning.
was deeper 
shame was blind Your arms were wider And my guilt was gray Your love was greater still But greater still Good morning, welcome to Southwest Community Church. My name is Kimberly Ford, and my husband, three boys, and I have called this our church home for over three years now. And we'd love for this to be a place that feels like home to you too. And what really helps is being able to visit with those around you. So I'd love for you guys to just introduce yourselves and say hello right now. Now, as you make your way back to your seats, our ushers are gonna be bringing up the registers. This is another way where we can connect as a family together. It's got a place where you can let us know that you're here, but also at the bottom, there's a place where you can share the things that God is doing, either celebrating that or asking for prayer for things that you would like somebody to come alongside you with. And uh, either a pastor or an elder or one of our prayer team will reach out to you and be praying for you this week. And also, as you were coming in, uh, there were worship guides that were given out. This is a place where you can take notes and follow along with what Pastor Arnie is teaching. There is a QR code in the back, but there's also paper. And so if you did not get one and you would like one, would you please raise your hand and leave it up? And one of our ushers will make sure to get one of those into your hands. And then before Pastor Arnie comes up, I'm going to pray. God, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we get to have to worship you, to turn our gaze on you, to remember your greatness and your faithfulness. And God, I pray that today that we would leave here changed by your truth, by your presence, and by your word. And God, I pray that you would anoint Pastor Arnie to teach and to share and to um, open up your word and to point us to how to live it out on a daily basis. And we just thank you, God, for your goodness. We pray all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. So glad you've joined us for worship this morning, and I am glad to be back. I'd like to thank Pastor Than uh, for covering for me last week. He was uh, at the end of his at the end of VBS and wanted to share a little bit about that. How many of you were here last week and got the pleasure of uh, listening to Than? Yeah. Uh, so after that, he has gone on a sabbatical, so we will not see him for two months. Apparently, that's what VBS does to people. <laughs> Uh, They force them out for two months. That's why I disappear for the week. Uh, I want to come back strong. But as most of you know, uh, I do have a son that is active duty in the military. He is in the Navy and he serves in Oahu. And so my wife and I had the privilege of spending the week uh, with him and his wife. And if you don't know this, he actually lives on a sailboat. He is really taken to the water, lives on the sailboat. I think we have a picture of the boat. I wanted to share a little bit 
bit of our time with you, because if you don't know this, to get that boat to Hawaii, he and my wife and his wife uh, sailed it in November from uh, California all the way to, uh, to Oahu. Took them 25 days, 2,500 miles. I had to sail through the night. It was an amazing experience for them, and I'm glad it was for them and them alone. Um, <laughs> Because my son, uh, as he would normally do, wanted to give me a taste of sailing. And so, uh, so we went from, we sailed from Oahu down to uh, Kauai. Uh, on the way there, we were with the wind, so it took us 24 hours. On the way back, it took us a little longer, 36 hours. But I will tell you this. If you've ever thought about sailing in the ocean, don't. Don't do it. it. It is brutal. It's hard work. I was being tossed around like a little rag doll. We had 25 to 30 knots of wind. I, I whole new respect for what my wife and uh, my son did uh, doing that crossing because I only spent uh, a few days on on his little boat. I, I think, yeah, we have we have some pictures of that. But he did teach us how to sail. And so most of you know Maya. Uh, he taught Maya how to sail. Do we have a shot of Maya? Yeah, there's Maya. Uh, she's happy. She's at the helm. Uh, we, uh, we learned to sail. And uh, he even taught me how to do some sailing. And I think we have a, a video clip of him teaching me how to sail his boat. I'm sailing! <laughs> yes, that's about as far as I got. They, they had to tie me to the mask uh, to keep me in the boat, uh, but, uh, but we had a great time with, uh, with the family, and uh, like I said, we call ourselves here at Southwest a family of families, so thank you for being a part of this. Uh, if you're looking for a church home, uh, I pray that uh, we would have the opportunity to love on you and to serve you in any way that we can. But we're also a church that picks books of the Bible, and we walk through them verse by verse, sometimes word by word. Uh, we do that for a couple reasons. It's the strongest form of discipleship, number one. And number two, we don't get to pick and choose what to preach or teach here at this church because we believe in preaching the entire counsel of God. And so we have been walking through 1 Peter uh, for, uh, for about a year, a year plus, and uh, we've been walking through verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And the last time we were together, Peter encouraged the believer to look both inward and ex external, in internal and external. He encouraged us really to look at the internal state of the believer and encouraged us to walk with pure Purity and integrity in our lives, and then he also wanted us to look at our hearts, and, and we talk about the testimony of the believer, our attitude, our reputation, and our submission to him and to his word, and today, Peter wants to highlight Jesus, and what a, what a wonderful day, what a wonderful passage just to highlight who Jesus is and what he has done for the believer I've said this many times that as a church, we exist for God's glory and for the fame of Jesus Christ. And in our passage today, Peter is going to be leaning into the fame of Jesus Christ and exalting Jesus Christ for about a year and a half now. I, I came to this church and I said this, I said, the vision that I'm bringing to this church is that we would be God-centered, Christ-exalting, spirit-led body of believers who exist to love God deeply love people genuinely and make disciples continuously. And so in that phrase or in that statement, you see many things. You see the Trinity. You see the great commandment. You see the great commission. It's really taking scripture and boiling it down, boiling it down to the purpose of the local church. And so today we get to tap into one of those first few statements, which is my prayers that we are Christ exalting Body, that we are a Christ exalting people, because what Peter does here today is he reminds us to lift up on high the name of Jesus, to exalt Jesus Christ. 
So what does the word exalt mean? Well, it means just that. It means to lift up on high, to raise up on high, and really to lift up on high to the highest level possible. And that would be my prayer as a church is that we would lift Jesus Christ high. We would raise him up. We'd raise him up in our minds. We'd raise him up in our hearts. We'd raise him up in our worship. We would raise him up in our lives and the way you and I live our lives. In other words, it's really coming to the reality that Jesus Christ is Lord of our lives. We've talked about the difference between being a cultural Christian and an authentic Christian. This is one of those moments, and this is one of those passages where we're going to be reminded not only to exalt the name of Jesus Christ, but to make him Lord of our lives. Don't simply be a cultural Christian. Jesus must be Lord of your life. Spoiler alert, culture Christians don't make it to heaven. Authentic Christ followers who follow the Lordship of Jesus Christ will spend eternity with him. Now this thinking of making Jesus Lord of our lives or exalting him or praising him or raising him on high is countercultural. Because, see, you and I live in a day and age where we are taught to exalt self, not to exalt anyone else. In other words, it's all about self-promotion and self-gratification and building our own brand. You and I swim in the waters of self-promotion and self-branding. But as Christians, our goal must be to promote and exalt Jesus Christ. Not only in our minds and in our hearts, but in our lives to live for him and to make him known in the world. And as a church, we must exalt Christ. We must lift him up high. We must promote him. We must worship him. We must live for him. See, we must come to the reality in every individual life life that Jesus is our Lord. That he is our Lord that he is our master, that that he is our senior pastor, that he's our leader, he's our king, he's our sovereign ruler. In other words, he is everything to us. And so if you're an authentic Christ follower this morning, and if he is Lord of your life, and if he truly is everything, then the call this morning from Peter is to exalt him, to exalt him in our worship, to exalt him in our hearts, to exalt him in our lives and how we live our lives. And this is not a new theme in the New Testament. We see the exaltation of Christ over and over and over in Scripture. Let me give you a few examples. Acts 2, 33. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, talking about Jesus Christ, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Acts 5.31, God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Philippians 2.9, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name above every name. Hebrews 7.20, For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. The exaltation of Jesus Christ is nothing new. See, the first century church understood that God has exalted Jesus Christ. Therefore, as believers, we follow suit. We exalt him as well. First century church understood what it meant to have Jesus exalted. They were a Christ-exalting people. They were a Christ-exalting church. May we be the same. May we live for the exaltation of Jesus Christ. We're not here to promote self. We're not here to promote celebrity pastors. We're not here even to promote the name of Southwest Community Church. We're here to promote the name of Jesus Christ because he is our Savior. He is our everything. He is our Lord. He is our master. So we will exalt him. I love the words of John Piper. He says it this way. He says, if you want the Spirit's power in your life, I encourage you to make Jesus the center of your life. Maybe an honest question to you this morning, is Jesus Christ truly the center of your life? If not, why not? What's getting in the way? What's stopping you from allowing Jesus to be Lord of your life? 
See, Peter, the, this morning, I, I love our passage this morning. We're going to co- cover a couple verses, but he really gives us a pathway to exaltation. In other words, he says this. He says, for the, for the authentic believer out there, here's how you can exalt Christ. And then he highlights Jesus Christ to us. He actually gives us kind of six pointers on how to exalt Christ. And he says, exalt him in your mind, exalt him in your heart, and exalt him with your life. So follow along with me. 1 Peter 3, 18 through 20 says this. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they, were for, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. So to exalt Jesus is to sanctify him in our hearts. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. To sanctify meanings means to set apart. So we're going to set Jesus Christ apart in our hearts. In other words, our hearts is reserved for a special place for the lordship of Jesus Christ. So we're going to sanctify him in our hearts and exalt him with our lives. So let's just follow along what Peter says. Six encouragements to exalt Jesus. Number one, exalt Jesus, first of all, for his suffering. Exalt him for his suffering. Now, we know the story of Jesus. We know about his crucifixion. We know his brutal death, that he died. But this morning, I want to encourage you to make his suffering personal in your life. He's your Lord. He's your Savior. He's your Master. He suffered for you personally. 18a says this, for Christ also suffered. Those are Peter's words. He suffered. He suffered for you and he suffered for me. He was beaten. He was ridiculed. He was spat upon. He was whipped. He was mocked as a king. He was stripped. Giant spikes pierced through his hands and his feet. He hung on that cross, gasping for air for hours, barely holding on to physical life, and he finally gave up his spirit. And he did all of that for you personally. Exalt him for his suffering. I don't know if you've ever been at the bedside of a dying individual. But I have several times. And it is painstakingly painful to watch a human being die. It's long. Can be long. Can be difficult and can be hard, and to watch a human being take their last breath will forever be etched in your memory if you have not experienced it. And as painful and hard as it is to watch someone die, Peter says this morning that Jesus Christ died the most horrendous death, the cruelest death, the most brutal death, and suffered for you personally. So all I'm asking you to do this morning is believe that reality and enter into that reality. In other words, know your Savior well enough to know that he suffered and died for you so that you may have eternal life, so that you may have fellowship with him, so that you may enter into his glory. And once that settles into your heart, now there's a new way and a new motivation and hopefully a new life to exalt him. Exalt him for who he is. Exalt him for the suffering that he did on your part. See, we must remember his suffering and exalt him for what he has done for you and what he has done for me. Secondly, exalt Jesus for his sacrifice. Not only did he suffer, he sacrificed. 18b says this, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. In other words, Jesus paid that ultimate price for our salvation. His sacrifice for sinners like you and me is worthy of our exaltation, worthy of our praise, worthy of our worship, worthy of taking up our cross daily and living for him. 
See, Peter communicates the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ in a powerful way. Do you see it there in Peter? He says this, he sacrificed once for sins, or literally once and for all. Meaning this, Peter is reminding us that that payment for our sins, for the sins of mankind, was a one-time payment. It doesn't need to be repeated. It was done once, once and for all. It was that it was that substitutionary death on the cross, that sacrificial death on the cross. And the Jews of Peter's day were too familiar with that sacrificial system of the atonement of blood for the sins of the nation of Israel. Millions of animals were killed for the atonement. During the Passover alone, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, every year they have the Passover. During the Passover alone, there's been estimated that 250 sheep would be sacrificed. 250,000 sheep would be sacrificed in just the Passover alone. And Peter says this. He says, we no longer live in that sacrificial system because the innocent lamb, the one, has paid the ultimate sacrifice once and for all for the sins of mankind. In, in other words, it's, it's been done. See, the innocent, pure, holy blood of Jesus Christ has paid for the sins of the world once and for all. Therefore, exalt him. Hebrews 1.3 says this, He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purifications for sin, there's our key phrase, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. In other words, we exalt the sacrifice of Jesus because he made the purifications for the sins of the world that day on the cross. It's his work. It's what he did. Never forget that sin caused the sinless Jesus to take on the wrath of God on the cross. And he did it for you. And he did it for me. Peter here reminds us that this death, his death was from the righteous for the unrighteous. That's significant. In other words... When Jesus died that day for you and I, it was, it was the holy for the unholy. It was the perfect for the imperfect. It was the sinless God-man for the sinful mankind of all humanity. Therefore, exalt him. See him for who he is. See him for what he has done for you personally. Exalt him in worship and exalt him with your lives. Number three, exalt Jesus Christ for his reconciliation. Peter goes on, he says, not only did he suffer, not only did he sacrifice, he reconciled us to God. Look at 18c, he says that, that he might bring us to God. See, that, that's, that, that's an amazing phrase right there. The work of Jesus Christ on the cross has brought authentic believers to a perfect relationship with the holy God. In other words, the unholy to the holy. That's a miraculous piece of work. Look at what Jesus has done for you with his life, with his perfect sinless life, with his shed blood on the cross. He paved the way for sinful, corrupt, dying mankind to be in a right relationship with a holy, perfect, sovereign, glorious God. That is supernaturally miraculous. Jesus has provided reconciliation for the sinner to know and truly know God. Not just pretend to know him, not just be a cultural Christian, not just simply give him our lip service, but to truly know him and to be known. Paul drives this point home in 2 Corinthians 5. He says this, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself, gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that is, in Christ God reconciled the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. It's the power of the gospel. Do you see the beauty of God's redemptive plan here? Do you see the power of the gospel? All comes from God through Jesus Christ. He reconciles us to himself. 
And because of that sweet gift, we now have the ministry, the privilege to preach that reconciliation message to the world. See, one way you and I can exalt him is to take that ministry of reconciliation to our neighbors and to our friends and to our family and to the people who don't know him. See, before service, we, we gather up here, the worship team and I, we gather up here, we pray, we kind of go through the, the order of service and we pray together. And while we were praying, one of the worship members was praying for the lost that he knows. And in his prayer, he said, may I have the boldness to tell my friends about Jesus. It's my prayer for the entire church. It's a beautiful prayer. And it's, it's our calling as Christ followers. We've been reconciled as sinful people to a holy God. Therefore, let, let's actively share our story with the world. Let's be part of the reconciliation story of someone else. It's a beautiful gift given to us. Let's give it to others. Number four, exalt Jesus for his victory. When Jesus took your sins and mine on the cross, he took the world's sin on his shoulders, he died on the cross, he became the ultimate victor. See, the, the, see, the beauty about Christianity is we know the end of the story and we know we're on the winning team because he has already won. He is the victor. And so if he is our Lord and if he is our Savior, we're on the winning team. Why would you not sign up for that? I've, been, I've spent a lot of my career in the athletic world. Every night, you don't know who's going to win, right? In Christianity, guess what? We know. So give me that jersey. I want to be on the winning team. We're already on the winning team because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. In that precious moment, he was victorious over sin, over Satan, over death and destruction for all time. Peter says once and for all, he has won the ultimate battle for you and for me. So let's exalt him. See, it blows my mind when we open a worship service with a song like, there's joy in the house of the Lord and you look around the room and you think you might be at a funeral rather than celebrating the joy of the Lord, right? Because the reality is if we are coming in here full because of the work that he has done and is doing in our lives on a weekly basis, we come with anticipation and excitement because we get to exalt him as a corporate family, as a body, because we're on the winning team. This is our celebratory time, now again, I'm, if you know me, you know I'm not looking for the raw, raw, fake service. I'm, I'm not all about that. But I am, I am about genuine believers tapping into the reality of what God has done for them. And if you are like me, I cannot keep that joy to myself. It's got to come out in some form and in some way. See, some believe that Jesus was not victorious on that day on the cross. There are some that believe that he never really died. They claim that he was merely, he merely fainted into a semi-coma there on the cross. And then he, when he was put in the coolness of that tomb, that, that he awoke because of the coolness of the tomb, unwrapped himself and walked out. Well, a couple problems with that theory. Number one, look, look at the words of our passage. First of all, 18, the last part of verse 18 says this, being put to death in the flesh. Doesn't get much clearer than that. Peter, in the last part of verse 18, says this, he died for the sins of the world physically. He, he gives two, two really important phrases. He says being put to death in the flesh, but then made alive in the spirit. In other words, he was alive in the spirit, but dead to flesh, right? This is, the, this is the hypostatic union, fully God, fully man. He was God while he was on the cross. He was God in the tomb. We're going to see that here in a few moments. So he was alive, but physically, because he took on physical form, he died. He died as a physical man. And Peter wants us to get the reality of that. He, he didn't just pass out. He wasn't in a semi-coma. He died physically as a human we also see the fact in John 9 that Roman soldiers, see, see, 
what, what Roman soldiers would do at a crucifixion, that they, they would hang the criminal on the cross and that they wanted, wanted them to suffer by slowly suffocating to death. In other words, their, their lungs would just slowly, slowly take on fluid and they would slowly suffocate and they, they wanted them to suffer. That's why they didn't want their legs broken because they would have to push themselves up, catch a breath, and then let themselves down as, as they were hanging on a cross. And so typically they wouldn't break the legs. But if you look at John chapter 19, it says eventually after a time of suffering, they broke the legs of the two criminals. But you know who they didn't break the legs of? Jesus. Why? Because in John 33, we read that the soldiers didn't break the legs of Jesus because he was already dead. Right, so, so the theory that he just passed out doesn't hold. Peter says he died a death. In John 19, we see that they didn't break his legs because he died. Also, in verse 34 of John 19, we also see that one of the soldiers pierced his side where blood and water flowed out. This was a physiological sign that he was actually dead. Jesus died physically that day. And Peter's saying something significant. Humanly, he died that day. Spiritually, he lived on. Why? Because he's God. He's the God man. And Peter wants to remind every authentic believer that you and I worship a supernatural being, God incarnate. He was fully God, fully man on this earth. Look at the next phrase. But was made alive in the spirit. Now, the English misses it a little bit because it really just says that he was alive in spirit. See, Jesus being God has always been alive in the spirit. And that day on the cross, when he died physically, he continued to be alive spiritually. And if that weren't enough evidence that he was the God man and that we should exalt him, look at what he does next. Number five, we need to exalt him for his proclamation. Because in that moment, in those three days, something supernatural happened. We exalt Jesus because in that dark hour of his physical death, he was alive spiritually. And in that state, in those three days, before his resurrection, he does something supernatural and amazing. Look at at 19 through 20a, in which he, Jesus, went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formally did not obey. So, So what's going on here? What was Jesus up to? What was his spirit up to when he was in the tomb? That's the question. Let's look at a couple important aspects. First of all, Peter says he went somewhere. That communicates that in a spiritual realm, he traveled. He moved from one place to another. In other words, he had a place to go. He had a mission to accomplish. He had something to do. Okay, so, so picture it. Jesus is dead physically, but alive spiritually. And since he's alive spiritually, he was still on mission in the three days in the tomb. His body lay in the tomb, but spiritually, he had a place to go. And Peter tells us that he went to proclaim. There was a proclamation. This pro- proclamation was a triumphant announcement that he was indeed king of kings and lord of lords so obvious questions where did he go and who did he give this proclamation to well peter tells us see in the ancient world heralds would come to town to make a public announcement to celebrate a military victory in other words the battle had been won And that is what Jesus is doing here. He was not sharing the gospel. He was not teaching anymore. He was proclaiming his victory over sin, Satan, death, and destruction for all time. In in a sense, in, in in our common terminology, we would say this. He was taking a victory lap. He was just taking a victory lap. Well, where and to whom? Says that... He went to the spirits in prison. So Peter tells us exactly where he went and who he was was proclaiming to. The spirits in prison. They're not human, they're spirits. Specifically, they were demons. Ever since the fall of Satan, Satan and demons have been in an ongoing spiritual warfare of the souls of people. 
The spiritual battle continues today, but Jesus in this moment visits the spiritual prison where spirits or demons reside. And he is there to remind them that he is victorious. The prison that he refers to, you can find that in the book of Revelation, literally known as the bottomless pit or literally the pit of of abyss. If you read Revelation, you will see that Satan himself will be held in this exact same prison during the millennium. So, So Peter's giving us some very, very interesting information. To be clear, Jesus, in the three days he was in the tomb, spiritually visited this demonic spiritual prison to proclaim his victory. And we need to exalt him for that. And don't miss this, church. It was a proclamation of power, of authority, of lordship. Jesus is the victor both in the material world and in the spiritual world, and he wanted everyone to know that. And Peter says, I want everyone to know that. In other words, even though he was dead spiritually or dead physically, he was alive spiritually. And in in that case and in that place, he went and proclaimed his victory and his authority and his lordship before he rose physically from the grave on the third day, which brings us to point number six, and it's this. Let's exalt him for his patience. I don't know about you, but I'm so glad Jesus is patient with me because I'm an imperfect individual. I'm sinful. Redeemed, yes. Secured in my eternal state, yes. Sinful, absolutely. Absolutely. But Jesus is patient with me and he's patient with you. And and Peter ends our passage with a powerful analogy of God's grace and patience to mankind. And he uses the story of Noah to do it. Look at the end of verse 20. He says, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. So, So here he says this, we're going to exalt Jesus Christ for all of these things and we should exalt him for his patience not only on us personally, but to the corrupt world in which he lives in. And he's like, and he says this, he says, if you don't believe that, look at the story of Noah and God's patience there. And you and I know the story of Noah and the ark, but what we forget many times is that it took Noah 120 years to build that ark. Now think of that just for a moment. In that 120 years, Noah was an acting preacher of righteousness. He was saying this, God has spoken, God is holy, we are not, judgment is coming, God's wrath is coming, be saved, here's a way to be saved, get in my boat. The ultimate sailor is Noah. My family and I were talking about that last week. Here we are in the middle of the ocean. We're in the middle of the night. You know, it's 2 a.m. My wife and I are at the helm, and we're talking about, can you imagine Noah? It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. He was on a boat with no sails, no engine. no. He's just out there like a cork in the water, just floating with a million animals, right? It's unbelievable. But look at the the true ministry of Noah. For 120 years, he warned of the judgment of God and even provided a way for deliverance for them. And after 120 years, grace ran out. The door was closed, the rain came, and death and destruction reigned. And Peter says only eight souls were saved. In a like manner, Jesus is the boat. See, you you and I live in 2024 where we are experiencing the patience of God, but there will be a day that our time comes to an end. So he's put preachers on the planet like myself who are called and gifted to give the good news of Jesus Christ. 
But there will be a day when God's patience runs out and the world will experience the wrath of God. And, and, and I say this not to scare anyone. I, I don't believe in scare tactics in salvation. I say these words to preach the truth. God is patient and gracious to a point. And just like the story of Noah, it'll come to an end. Question is, will you be on the boat when it does? I'm going to close with 2 Peter 3, 9 and 10. says this, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Right? So, so there's the message. God's patient. He's loving. He, he wants everyone to come to repentance. He wants everyone to recognize their sin. He wants everyone to come to a place where Jesus Christ is Lord of their life. <laughs> But read the rest of the passage. But, huge transitional phrase there, but there's going to be a day that it's all going to come to an end. There'll be a day that the Lord will come like a thief when the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Be on the boat. Exalt Jesus Christ. Live for him. Let him move in you this morning. If you do not know him, I would invite you, man, dude, just, just talk to God this morning. Be honest with him. I haven't made you Lord of my life because I'm too busy being the Lord of my own life and surrender to him. If you want to talk with somebody or, or pray with somebody, we're going to have people up here up front afterwards. Come, come see one of them. Come see me. If you know him this morning, if you already know him, man, exalt him, worship him, praise him, live your life for him every single day because he has done a miraculous thing in your life and in mine. So live as if you believe it. Let him come alive in you. Share his grace, share his gospel with the world around you. And guess what? If, if you're like me and if you're doing that, it's going to take some patience. It's going to take some love. It's going to take some sacrifice. Sometimes it's going to get messy because sinful people are messy people. But you know what? He will empower you to make a difference in this world. So let's be a church. Let's be a people that not only exalt the name of Jesus Christ, but a church that calls the world to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So God, we come before you this morning and we thank you for the power of your gospel. We thank you for the truths of your word. God, build this church in the likeness and image of your son, Jesus Christ. And today, may we be reminded of the joy and privilege it is to worship you and to exalt you for all that you have done, your sacrifice and your suffering, your proclamation and your patience and your grace and your love. God, we thank you and praise you. Dear Jesus, thank you for being our Lord and Savior. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Why don't you stand as we close in song this morning?
clap. We can celebrate the Lord's goodness. Amen. Just a couple of things before we end. Just want to encourage you, uh, right here at 10 a.m., we're going to have our annual church meeting. All are welcome to come. And then we're starting a new series uh, that our very own Luke Hansen is going to be teaching through apologetics. And that starts also this Wednesday at 6.30. And then finally, we're going to have prayer partners up front. And I just want to encourage you, prayer is just a, a it shows our dependence on the Lord. And so we have these ladies and gentlemen up here to come and pray with, to pray over you, to pray with, maybe to celebrate something that God has done, a praise that you want to just uh, testify with and have them pray with you. But don't, don't delay. Come forward. Pray with those people. They're here for you. And uh, other than that, may God bless you guys. Have a great week.